Again, we are blessed with visitors. I'm thankful that you are here. You can be doing a lot of things on a Sunday evening, especially those who've been at services on Sunday morning. You can say, well, this is a holiday weekend, and I've already been at services, taken the Lord's Supper, and I think uh, we'll just enjoy the family this evening. But you brought your family, brought your children, brought your grandchildren. Thank you for being here. It means you have an interest in spiritual things. You've taken the time and set aside this time that we're going to concentrate upon spiritual things, the, the Word of God. And I trust that you will benefit from being here and participating uh, by listening and applying and thinking about the Word of God along with me. On Sunday evenings, we have been dealing with the fruit of the Spirit, those nine characteristics that a Christian needs to manifest. We've emphasized that the fruit is singular, but it involves nine facets. You cannot pick and choose which one you want to manifest. If the Spirit of God is directing your path, this is an objective manifestation of that which we cannot see. I can't see the spirit working in you. We, ain't, we can't see our spirits. But we understand that this will come from one who is walking according to the spirit, walking according to the teachings of God. This will be manifest in our lives. And therefore, it is something that we should want to do. So here's one of them. This is self-control. And you can just imagine how meddlesome the preacher is going to be this evening. Because we will have application of the word of God. But if that is something that troubles you, that all of a sudden when we apply this lesson, that it is meddlesome, it's getting personal, and you really feel uncomfortable, then maybe we really need to deal with this. Because why meekness wasn't like that? Why joy wasn't like that? But self-control sometimes just brings in terror and anticipation. What in the world? How is he going to apply it? And one of the problems is that we don't have a lot of times where this particular Greek word is found in the New Testament. So maybe that leaves preachers, well, I've got to fill the time with something, so I think I'll just be meddlesome tonight. But we're going to make application where I think Bible makes it, and I hope it will be helpful uh, to you. When we think about the word self-control, a lot of your translations, especially the King James, will say temperance. What comes to your mind when you say temperance? A lot of the older ones will talk about the temperance society. We're talking about alcohol. We're talking about drinking whiskey and beer and that sort of thing. That's what this thing's about, about this self-control that you need to, uh, to, not, you need to be a, a teetotaler, not, not to be involved in drinking this stuff, temperance. That's kind of what's connected with that thought. But you'll notice in 1 Corinthians, the ninth chapter, in verse 25, that the Apostle Paul gives an illustration of things that we understand because we are athletic-minded. We understand sports, and, and we're a society that uh, praises that. But notice in verse 25, every man that striveth in the games... Well, these were the Isthmus games that were held periodically in Corinth, or we think maybe about the Olympic games. We know how much training takes place. Every man that striveth, participating and exerting that energy in the games, exercises, my Bible says, self-control in all things, not just alcoholic beverages, all things. And when we observe this particular illustration, we wouldn't limit it to drinking beer and whiskey and wine. But there's that word a lot of times translated temperance. We see it's a broader application. He applies it here to those, well, that's just people striving in the games. Now listen to him. Now they do it to receive a corruptible crown. Why do we as Christians do it? But we an incorruptible. That's speaking about heaven. That's speaking about the crown of life. That's speaking about the crown of victory. That we have indeed with the grace of our Lord overcome sin. And overcome the things of this world. Through our faith in Christ. 
and therefore we receive an incorruptible crown. We're not talking about just drinking alcohol. We're talking about self-control at all things, and it is essential. It is essential to us having that crown of victory one day. That's why it's very important to see we're manifesting this in all facets of our life. What can we say about it? Aristotle gives us a kind of indication when he speaks about uh, virtue in the, in the Greek language where he brings this word to play. And I think we can get a hold of it when we say, well, take hold of yourself. We can might say, you know, get a grip. Get a grip on yourself. Restrain yourself. I saw a picture of the other day of self-control where it's a dog with a leash and his tail is holding the other end of that leash. Self-control. And that's exactly what we're supposed to be. It's kind of like the tires. We see in the commercial, gripping, gripping hold of the pavement. Get a grip. Hold yourself. Have this control of yourself. And as Aristotle says, the ability to restrain desire by reasoning. And it's what it's involved with. It's when it's set on base enjoyments. I did not say sinful enjoyments. It can be that. But the very base of our desires, things that make up us, that we have, the base enjoyments and pleasures that may be right in themselves, we must have the ability to reason and to keep those things from taking control of us. He goes on to say, that we should have, or that this, this self-control is that determination to even suffer pain in self-denial. And that is how fervent we are, we should be, in, the, in understanding this particular word. So how do we apply it? Well, some of it is what we're going to find in Scripture. And I think we see this uh, idea of sexual desire in Acts 24 and verse 25 that we notice that here is a, 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 a man of authority, and he has a wife by the name of Drusilla, and you say, what is the problem? They're married. What, what, what are you talking about sexual desire and, and out of control? Well, we'll find that in verse 25, the nature of Paul's sermon that day was this. As he preached the faith of Jesus Christ, he reasoned of righteousness, that which is right, and self-control and the judgment to come. It's like he's got a three-point sermon working. And when he speaks about uh, the, concerning the faith in Christ, what would your three-point sermon would be? Well, you might be righteousness. That gospel is the, is the, the source of learning what is right. And we come to that word of God. Would you pick self-control? Say, no, that'll be later on down the road. Are you going to talk about the judgment to come? No, I want to talk about heaven. Maybe I would talk about righteousness and joy and heaven to come. But that's not what Felix and Drusilla needed to understand. Because history tells us that they both have been married before. And they left their mates to be married to one another. Now you know what a preacher does. He needs to preach what is needed. And here he had the audience of Felix, the governor, and Drusilla, his wife. And he preached what's right and self-control. You desire Drusilla so much that you took her from another man. It's Drusilla that needs to learn the same thing. And the judgment to come. We're going to have to meet the Lord in judgment to give answer of what we've done. That was very essential to Felix's life. Now, sexual desire is something that we have in us as human beings. As we grow to a certain age, able to reproduce, we understand that. And should we look and just cut ourselves because we have those desires, just cut ourselves to pieces? No. No that they're there, and that's why self-control needs to uh, play a part in understanding this. And we see this in 1 Corinthians 7, verse 9. Let me paint the picture. 
The first Corinthians 7 is, is indeed showing that they had asked questions about the marriage relationship, especially a Christian has, one has become a Christian, but maybe was married before to a non-Christian who hasn't become a Christian yet. What are we going to do about that relationship, Paul? And what about all of these, uh, these, these troubling circumstances of persecution and trial? What about the marriage relationship? There they had some questions. And Paul answered them. He said, concerning, concerning the things he wrote, it's, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Now, if we go off from that and say, well, you need to be single, and it's not good to ever touch a woman, you'll, you'll misunderstand the point he's making. In these times of difficulties, it was better probably to reign single. But he says, but because of fornications, verse 2, let each woman have her own husband and man his own wife and his woman is her own husband. And let the husband render the wife her due. Likewise, also the wife and the husband. The wife hath not power over her own body, but the husband. And likewise, also the husband hath not power over her own body, but the wife. There's the sexual relationship being told about. It's her due. It's the due that each, uh, each partner in that marriage has to one another. Their body to belong to themselves. There's that relationship being talked about. He said, defraud ye not one another except to be but consent for a season that you may yourselves give yourself to prayer and may be together again that Satan tempt you not because you're very incontinency, lack of self-control. That you come back together again. Satan is going to take that natural desire that should be satisfied in the marriage relationship and he's going to be tempting you with that and if you lack self-control, you'll give in to that sin. So he says in verse 9, if they have not continency, or this idea of self-control, let them marry, for it's better to marry than to burn, which I believe to burn with passion. Now, who is he talking about there? Well, I've been divorced it was for the wrong reason. And according to Matthew 19, 9, the next relationship I have is adultery, if you call it marriage. And I'm, I'm, I'm applying this verse. I cannot live a celibate life. Paul says, if you have no constancy, then marriage. Better to marry than to burn with passion. Notice the pronoun they. Verse 8. He's talking to those who are not married, not those who have been divorced and still bound to a mate, but they're not married or they're widows. They have a right to the marriage relationship. But there's this idea that sometimes the sexual desire can be so strong. A lot of times in younger people, as they are dealing with those desires that are new to them, are people that have been married and divorced and now they have a new mate out of that sexual desire that they had and it is an area where self-control needs to be there we need to be able to say no to these desires we need to be i'm going to fulfill them in the right way and god has said the right way is marriage relationship it may seem so old-fashioned for young people to hear, uh, understand that, well, I'm going to save myself for marriage. But that's a godly point of view. That's what God would have you to do. Save yourself for that time. That's how it can be satisfied. God has not said, all right, I put this desire in you, but, I, but there's no way you can satisfy it lawfully. We don't have a God like that. Let the marriage bed be undefiled. He's going to judge adulterers and fornicators. Let marriage be had in honor among all. Let the bed be undefiled. We keep it pure, the two people that have a right to one another. So as we grow to adulthood, we are Christians and we're living the Christian life. We, we need to apply that self-control with those desires that hit us. How many... During the day, now speak to men and speak to boys. You're on the internet. You're, you're, you're dealing with email. Nothing wrong with that. You're looking up a subject. 
that may just be right in itself. And all of a sudden, here comes a picture of something you can click on. It may be pornography. That's happened. I'm not looking for that. What are you going to do about that at that moment? Are you curious? The picture may be attractive. It may be alluring. What do you do? You click on it. Self-control says, no, I'm not going to click on that. I'm not going to go there. Because that's going to lead me into an area that is unlawful. And that's where it applies to our life. If we're walking the way of the Holy Spirit and the direction that God leads us through his word, we're going to be able to say no to that. Get it off our screen. Avoid it. And you know, the more you do that, the stronger you are doing it the next time. And the next time you're stronger, stronger, where you, you build up this, this resistance. And he said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep control of that. I'm going to fulfill it lawfully in marriage. I'm going to wait for that relationship that becomes, that's where I'm going to do it. Until then, I'm going to have self-control over that. Because that is a very strong passion. What about food and drink? Bible speak about that? The Bible does, and it's what's interesting that I don't think I have preached on gluttony. I can't remember when. And you know what? You especially don't preach on gluttony, gluttony when the lunch you had a potluck. What preacher going to do that? Why? Well, potluck, you can kind of pile up that food and everybody's watching you. And everybody saw what you eat that day. We've got a brethren in the church. And he's going to preach on gluttony. He said, no way. I'm going to preach on that today. Because that is a time when you may be lacking self-control. And so you just don't want to go there. And so we don't ever preach on it. But Proverbs gives us wisdom to live by. In Proverbs, the 23rd chapter, and verses 1 through 8, wonder if the king invites you to... His banquet table. Maybe it's the president. Some, some ruler. And Proverbs says, When thou sittest to eat with the ruler, consider diligently him that is before thee. But look what's out there in front of you. His dainties. His food. And so much of it. Put a knife to thy throat. If thou be a man given to appetite. To me, he's talking about a little self-control. Now, that may be very drastic. That may be radical to you. What does he mean by that? I'm going to be in control of this thing. Be not desirous of his dainty, seeing that they are deceitful food. What is he talking about there? A lot of times in banqueting, especially with kings with an abundance, they would just go overboard. They would have days and days and days of eating flesh and just, uh, just eating and gorging themselves. He said, that's not, that's not the life of a wise man. Weary not thyself to be rich. Cease from thine own wisdom. Wilt thou set thine eyes upon that which is not? For riches certainly make themselves wings like an eagle that flies toward heaven. All of a sudden he quit talking about food and now he's talking about riches. And then he comes back to it. Eat not thou the bread of him that hath an evil eye. Neither desire thou his dainties. For as he thinketh within himself, so is he. Eat and drink, saith he to thee, but his heart is not with thee. The morsel which thou hast eaten shalt thou vomit up and lose thy sweet words. I think he's speaking about something else here now. And it's the idea that here, look what you enjoyed at my table. Now, I want you to say this. You are obligated to the king. And because of your appetite, because of your lack of self-control, we can be putting ourselves in that position where these things that are, are riches and that sort of thing that we can obtain, wonder if the king, his heart's not really with you, but he wants something from you. And he offers you all the food. He offers you his riches to maybe lie about this or condemn that person. You end up having to vomit up your words because you 
did not control your appetite. Now, those are the things we can get involved with. People can offer us things that we desire. And food is indeed one of them. We have to have food in order to, to live. And a lot of times when people, you know, what kind of food? Well, I, I, I just say, well, food is fuel. That's an easy way out, isn't it? Just have a, I have a lot of fuel. But it might not be the right kind of fuel. And we have to kind of govern that. We have to understand it. But this idea that this is something we have to have, we have to be able to drink, have water. But we must be able to have self-control to apply those things in certain situations. Look at verse 20 and 21 of Proverbs 23. Be not among the wine bibbers. I want you to notice the excess that is taking place here with those who are, are becoming drunk. They're staying long at the wine. Be not among wine bibbers, among gluttonous eaters of flesh. For the drunkard and the glutton shall come to poverty, and drowsiness will clothe the man with rags. I think you can see that banqueting is that idea here. They're just days and days, and they're drinking and they're. And they're staying long at the wine. They're eating flesh. And, and they're, doing, they're, they're sleeping. And they're not being prudent with their time or their energies of being productive. And that's where that sort of thing leads to. When we're out of control of our appetite. And I think we have to be involved with that. Especially at our time. I was thinking the other day. I, I, I come down Fairmont a lot. I was thinking the other day, I could start eating at 5 o'clock on Fairmont and go 24 hours and just eat. Throw drive throughs and I could just get all the food at different times. And there'll be times when I can start over with breakfast about 11.30 at night if I wanted to. Open all night, abundance of food, it's cheap. And, and you can just eat, literally, 24 hours. I know a lot of you say, well, well I, I'm, I'm trying to eat six times a day, and that's good. Eat the right things. But I need 24 hours a day. It's available. And we have to kind of put a knife to our throat. That may look good. But we can get in bad habits, and we can just say, well, I just go through the drive through No one has to know. Well, sometimes people, they have problems with food. And we cannot allow ourselves to get to that point. And we must say, I will have self-control. I must be willing with reason to say, I'll turn that down. And you know what? If that is a problem that you're having, just try it on one time. Something that you're tempted to have, you're, you just say no. And this is far cry from fasting. And yet we see in the Bible that when people were getting in control of themselves, and having control of their desires. A lot of times it was fasting and prayer. And maybe that's an area. So well I need to maybe work on that one day. And, and try that. Getting in control of our desires. Is something very much biblical. And we must be in control of our food. And our drink. And we see the latter part of Proverbs 23. Where such things lead to. They lead to tearing long at the wine and all the bad things that come from it. And what is God's remedy? Don't look at it when it's sparkling the cup. It don't have anything to do with it. And that's what we ought to do with alcohol. That's God's remedy for not getting to this point of staying long at the wine. And as Paul says to Timothy, there's medicinal purposes that we could uh, see. But, but the idea of, 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 of satisfying our appetite, if you're giving yourself the appetite, you've got to be in control of that. Now, look how Paul deals with this in bringing these things together in, in 1 Corinthians, the sixth chapter. That he says, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Meats for the belly and belly for the meats. But God shall bring to naught both it and them. There's our food. Goes into our belly, out the draw. I understand that's what, it, that's what it's all about. 
But he's also said, I will not be brought under the power of any. But the body is not for fornication. All of a sudden we see the sexual desire being talked about. But it's for the Lord and the Lord for the body. And therefore we see, in verse 18, we're to flee fornication. And we realize in verse 19, know ye not that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit which is in you, which you have from God. You're not your own. You are bought with a price. Glorify God, therefore, in your body. He didn't say, keep yourself from sex. Keep yourself from fornication. I'm not going to be brought under the power of that. They're equating, I have to eat, and I, therefore, I can commit fornication. It's a natural desire, just like me eating meat. But he says both of them. I will not be brought under the power of any. Why? Because we've got self-control. We're able to restrain ourselves. Use it in the proper manner. And we have to manifest that if we're following Christ. Thirdly. Dealing with another passion. That has to be in control. And that's something that can be used in a very constructive way. Of someone caring. Someone that's willing to stand up for truth in the face of error. I read where Jesus Christ in Mark the third chapter. When he was being accused of violating the Sabbath. Where he was involved and the people that he's doing this on the Sabbath. Therefore he's a sinner. He looked with anger. He had it. He looked with anger upon them because of their hardness of heart. Hardness of heart. It's hard for me to imagine Jesus Christ not being angry, not manifesting that physically when he took a scourge of ropes and he drove out the money changers, turned over the tables, drove out the the. the the animals and the money changers, it's hard for me to picture him not being angry and not maybe showing that. But you know what? They said, they remembered the scripture when they observed that uh, the zeal for thy house hath eaten me up in fulfilling scripture. So Jesus was angry. Ephesians 4, 26, be ye angry and sin not. We're not worth much to God if we don't have righteous indignation. If we don't do it, but it is righteous indignation. We can be angry and sin not. But he said, don't let the sun go down on your wrath. There are two words that we see in this area of this type of passion. Is anger and wrath. And both of them will send your soul to hell. You can do everything else right. But you will not inherit the kingdom of God. With these. And let's, let's notice. In Ephesians. While we're there in Ephesians 4.31. Where he speaks about both of them. And we have to put them away. That all bitterness. And wrath. And anger. So wrath and anger and clamor and railing be put away from you with all malice. Galatians 5 and verse 20 highlights one of them when he says, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousies, rats, factions, divisions, parties. And he says, and such like in which I forewarn you as I did forewarn you that they who practice such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Inheritance of heaven is what he's talking about. And there's the wrath. Colossians 3 and verse 8 speaks about what the Christian has to put to death in their life. And in verse, verse 8 says, but now do you also put them all away? Anger, wrath. Malice, railing, so forth. Shameful speaking out of your mouth. Oh, we're not going to curse. We're not going to take the Lord's name in vain. That's not that nasty talk and that filthy mouth you've got. That's not, that's, you can't have that as a Christian. But you can have wrath and anger. 
I'll be angry and sin not. What are these? What's the difference between wrath and anger? The two Greek words are distinguishable. When we speak in Galatians 5.20 of the wrath, we are speaking of one who blows up. Tumas is its word. Just blows up. Loses his or her temper. And orge, the other Greek word, it is more settling. It may last longer. But it may be finding its outlet a little bit later in revenge. Just kind of cold and calculating. But that anger is still there. And I will get even. That's why don't let the sun go down in your wrath. Don't allow it to keep festering and festering and festering. But he said, don't blow up either. Both of those are things that the Christian has to put to death. It didn't say, well, I'm going to tolerate it. It didn't say, well, you can do it sometime, and most of the time I'm okay. I told the class Wednesday night because we're studying the fruit of the Spirit. I mean, the work of the works of the flesh, rather. And one of those is dealing with wrath. And I remember having a boss. He was, a lot of ways, a great boss. I don't know if it's because of, you know, that's what abusive relationships are like. Maybe I was just young and being abused and, and, and didn't know what to do with it. But a lot of ways, he was, he was a good manager. Bottom line, and he's able to get things done. That, maybe I admired that part. But he was a boss who blew his top off. And I said to the class, we didn't have cell phones then. We had big bell telephones. And he'd throw it into the wall of our new, new offices. And I was in there with him. And I understood what made him mad. He'd throw it against the side of the wall. And then within just a few moments, everything was supposed to be okay. He's through with it. He got it off his chest. And everything's all right. No one. The secretary would come to my office a lot just crying. And I'd try to say, it's just the way he is. He does the personal, you know, all the things that abusive husbands say. It's not your fault, you know. And then trying to find an area where, you know, it's, it's really not about them. It's about him. And he might... Think, well, I got, I'm through with it, now it's okay, and he just blew up like that. That's not a Christian. That's a man of the world. That's not one that's striving to walk by the Spirit. He's sure not manifesting self-control. He said, well, how does one deal with that? I gave you examples of Jesus. Let me give you a contrasting one, and maybe you can... We can kind of have something constructive because you may be having trouble with losing your temper. You may get in road rage and do all sorts of horrible things because of traffic problems and people get in your spot in the parking lots and you just say, let's go to town over it, buddy. You got, my, you got my place. And women and men all have these issues. I don't care what the issue is, out of self, out of control, it's something we have to work on. But let's, let's notice what made the people mad at Jesus. On this occasion, he spoke about the three and a half years of famine in the days of Elijah the prophet. And what he said, he said, there were many widows in Israel during that time. But God sent Elijah to be taken care of by a woman that was not of Israel to Zarephath in the land of Sidon unto a woman that was a widow. That's a fact. That's not Jesus kind of twisting things. That's a fact. And there were many widows. Why did he do that? There were many lepers in Israel in the time of Elisha the prophet, and none of them was cleansed, but only Naam the Syrian, got in the army of a foreign nation. There were many lepers, but... We only healed one through God's power. That's a fact. 
And they were filled with wrath in the synagogue when they heard these things. They rose up. They're moving him toward a precipice where he's going to go over the cliff. And he goes safely out of their midst. What is happening there? It's pride. We are the people of God. We have a special place in the heart of God. And therefore, we're special with God when all men needed to repent. And he brings out these two facts. God, God sees people in other nations. And you're going to have to bring fruit worthy of repentance. And all those things Jesus are trying to uh, teach them, but they're full of wrath because you hit at their pride. And they blow up. This is not the way it's supposed to be. This is my world. This is how it's supposed to be in my world. And when that's ever disrupted, wrath hits. Two moths hits. And we blow up. And then we get off our chest. Well, I'll set them straight and we're back at it again. Maybe we got a problem with selfish pride. And thinks the world ought to rotate around us. And we get our way all the time. Because we're special. And you're not. Nobody's special. We, we got to consider others better than ourselves. Paul says. But look at Jesus. What did he do? The zeal for thy house, God. Righteous indignation. They were making God's house a house of prayer. It's made a den of robbers. It wasn't about Jesus and selfish pride and the way it, it, it would be to please him. He was seated in the eyes of a righteous God. There's that righteous indignation. And therefore, he can still have control of his passion and use it in a constructive and vivid way. Throwing a phone across the, the room, blowing up, cutting someone down verbally, Saying something about a person that's unflattering because you just got to get it off your chest. That's not constructive. That's sinful. But Jesus was angry. And he looked with anger when he healed the man with the withered hand because he saw a, a closed and hardened heart. Again, it wasn't about him personally. He felt for them. Maybe that's how we have righteous indignation without sinful wrath and without sinful anger. The world doesn't owe us anything. God has provided salvation for all mankind. He hasn't made this world where it operates at your command and your demands and you do it the way I want to do it or we're going to have war. And that happens in business, it happens in offices, and I've seen it all of my life. But I should never see it in the life of a Christian. Because walking by the Spirit says we have self-control. My final point, then what should I be busy in? Why not growing in self-control? Did you know that's what we're supposed to do? Look at 2 Peter 1, 6 through 8, where the Apostle Peter speaks about these virtues. And we say, well, these are good. And he says, in your knowledge, self-control, the more we learn about God, the more we learn about the world around us, the more we learn about things, that we need to manifest, according to that knowledge, we need to manifest self-control. And in your self-control patience, there's the steadfastness. I'm going to keep going that way and we'll stay fast in that he says for if these things are yours and abound they make you not idle nor unfruitful unto the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ and that word knowledge denotes an intense form of gnosko it means intimacy I'm gaining in looking and being a part of that intimate relationship with the Lord I'm abounding in self-control. And maybe it starts with, well, I'm out of control with my world. Isn't that what happens in road rage? You just cut me off. 
Why? I had a right to that lane. And a lot of times it starts when we can say, you know, we can let that go. Get a grip. Is it going to keep you two or three more seconds away from going through that light? Reasoning. Maybe that's why mom told me to count to ten before you talk when you're mad. To try to have self-control over the situation. And where do we choose our elders? Other Christians? What do we look for in elders? Well, hospitality. Yeah. They hold to the faithful word. Yeah, they're sound and they're teaching. They're a lover of good. They're sober minded. They're just. They're holy. And they're self controlled. Young men, if losing your temper is your problem, get a grip. We need you down the road as spiritual leaders of a congregation. That you've learned of the mastery of yourself and your pride or whatever those things that are causing you to blow up and you are mastering those things. That's who we look to as leaders in the Lord's church. That's what others can look up to when they're young and you're older and they begin to realize this is, this is a characteristic that's good. We're to grow in it. We are to realize this is essential for spiritual leadership. And it is something that I must put into practice in things that may be very strongly desired. Sex, food, drink, and my passion for the way it ought to be. And it's not working that way. So we just blow up. Those are strong passions. They can be channeled in a very constructive way. And the gear that will help us channel it in the right way is called self-control. Lesson is yours. May we keep working on ourselves and in our character as a Christian. And as I said earlier, and I'll make this last point from this series, is that when you look at the fruit of the Spirit, and you look at the context of Galatians 5. It was something that was in the context that we are through love to be servants one to another. And I believe that the fruit of the Spirit wasn't given there so you can pride yourself. I've got all nine in my life. Look at me. No, it's what equips you to be a servant to others. They see in you love and just joy. They see you at peace with God and peace with your fellow man and not compromising the holiness of God to have that peace. They see long suffering. That man, that woman doesn't give up on that person. They don't give up. They don't give in. They have a long temper. But look what's happening in their life. And they just keep staying positive And keep that temper from blowing up and giving up. We look at kindness and goodness and gentleness and all those things. Meekness and self-control. And the context is for freedom did Christ set you free. And we have a freedom in Christ to be a servant of one another. And when he closes these nine manifestations of the Spirit, he says, against such there is no law. You are free in Christ to manifest every one of these things. And when you do, you will be equipped to be a great servant of others. They'll want to be around you. They will want to look up to you. They want to follow your lead. They want to follow your example. 
And I can't think of a better life to live than to be walking according to spirit, using my freedom not for selfishness, but to serve others. And focusing in on every one of those nine. So every one of those nine are going to be in my life so I can be a servant to others. I think we'll have the right attitude when we master them and we have to keep mastering them. And we will be the right type of servant. And I tell you, when you have a congregation filled with those manifesting the fruit of the Spirit, you've got a strong church. And I hope that's what we'll have tonight. If you have sinned, Maybe a public nature, and you just realize, well, I need to work on these things. You're among friends, you're among family. When I confess that false, I'm going to work on it. This may be the way I am today, but it's not the way I ought to be. And God, help me. Help me to be the type of Christian I need to be. And we're here to assist you and encourage you. But if something that you realize is amiss in your life and it's private, take care of it privately. But take care of it today so you will not lose your soul because any of these, fornication, idea of gluttony, idea of anger and wrath, whatever type of wrath and anger you have, blowing up or just vengeful, getting even, will keep your soul out of heaven. We don't want that. So make things right with the Lord as we stand and sing. Please come.